of thanking him for his tireless work during the past month, together with the other two co-chairs, Tris El Hadani and Jean-Pascal Defon, helping us to build up such an amazing program. So please join me uh, with a round of applause for all our three IPC co-chairs, and then the floor is yours. Thank you, Christian, for those uh, kind words. So I'm your moderator for this session, which is part two of Plenary One, but particularly looking at the industry perspective. So I do have the singular pleasure of introducing our next keynote speaker, uh, who's uh, Major General uh, Charles Bolden. I think he's joining us via Skype or Zoom, so we will see him just now. But just to run through his biography, it's quite a long biography, but I'm going to shorten it a little bit because we've got a time constraint. He started his career in the Marine Corps as a major general. And then in 2009, President Obama uh, appointed Bolden to be the 12th NASA administrator, making him only the second astronaut to hold the, that position. So while heading NASA, Bolden oversaw the transition from the space shuttle system to a new era of exploration, which was fully focused on the International Space Station and aeronautics technology development. So Bolin also led the development of the Space Launch System and the Orion uh, crew capsule, and oversaw the shift towards commercial space initiatives, handling resupply of the ISS. And I think probably one of the reasons why we have so many industry players in the room as well. He created NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate, responsible for developing the technology that will make future exploration missions successful. <laughs> so, Good morning. How are you doing there, Dr. Mumsami? I'm okay. Uh, oh, you're here. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm trying to find you. Way. Yeah. I, I've started, before you could come on, just <laughs> introducing you. So I'm just going to continue, and then I'll bring you back on. Thank, thanks, General Bolden. So during his career as a NASA astronaut, Bolden flew on four shuttle missions and logging over 680 hours in space. He piloted Space Shuttle Columbia in 1986 and Space Shuttle Discovery in 1990. And he also served as a mission commander on Space Shuttle Atlantis in 1992 and Space Shuttle Discovery in 1994. And he also served as the chief of NASA's safety division in the wake of the 1986 Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. He currently is the CEO of the Bolden Consulting Group, uh, a veteran-owned small business specializing in aerospace, national security, and leadership in education. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, General Bolden. Um, General Bolden, the floor is yours. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so very much. And, um, uh, Dr. Mansami, before I get started, let me, um, I'd ask you if you would, when you get back home to, uh, to South Africa, if you'd express my sympathies to the folk in KwaZulu-Natal for um, the damage and flooding over these last few days. Um, that ha happens to be the birthplace of one of my heroes, a young man by the name of uh, Nkosi Johnson, who I quote quite a bit uh, as I travel around the world, but, but his... Uh, a legacy of his life, his very short life, is uh, in Kosi's Haven, uh, and I, I, I just, my sympathy goes out to the people there. To the, the guest in this conference, let me offer, first of all, my apologies for not being able to be with you there in person. Uh, I would love to have, have done so, but I guess this is second best, so, so I'll try to make good use of my time, and I'll try to be very brief so that we can get onto the panel. You know, um, my, my, my hopefully my job today is to convince most of you that America is still open for business, uh, that we are incredibly warm and welcoming, and that it's really important for us to, ex to continue to expand the international partnerships that we have, particularly in the areas of uh, science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. I was very glad to see that that uh, one of the themes uh, uh, or one of the points of emphasis for the folk there in Morocco is STEAM and not just STEM. Uh, and I, because I happen to feel that the addition of the arts is critically important if we wanna try to get young people interested in the science and technology. A lot of time young kids don't think they, they like science and math 
and it's because they don't know how, fun, how much fun it is and they don't know how much they use it every day in their practice of the arts, whether it's music and the octal uh, numbering system in a musical scale or whether it's in the shapes that they make if they're, if they're graphic artists or drawing artists, anything. So, so thanks for emphasizing STEAM. Um, NASA serves, and I will speak as the former NASA administrator. I do not speak for the government or NASA or anybody now, but for me. But I, I do want to highlight uh, some of the work that NASA does because they tend to be a vehicle through which a lot of people from other countries can make entree into the United States. And, and so that's what I want to emphasize. I believe we're the largest, or NASA's the largest, it, it, next to the State Department and perhaps the Department of Defense, one of the most powerful soft power tools that we have here in the United States. NASA's work spans uh, a number of different portfolios, everything from space and earth science, uh, human space flight, aeronautics, communications and navigation actually, and uh, right on into education. Um, it, during my eight years or almost eight years as NASA administrator, I found that as um, we tried to, to carry out President Obama's mandate that we look to expand the number of quote unquote non-traditional partners with NASA, um, you, you know, we ended up with greater than 800 active international agreements with more than 120 nations. And many of those were in the area of STEM education because that's, that seems to be the easiest uh, area that every country has an interest in. And so it was pretty simple for NASA to, to sign an agreement to work, to partner with another country in the area of STEM education. So we worked everything from STEM edu STEAM education all the way up to human spaceflight. Um, one of the things that we emphasize today is the concept of public-private partnerships. And, and my understanding that a large portion of the audience this morning uh, or this afternoon for you uh, is the business community. And, and so that's where I would say whatever country happens to be yours, um, you should look for ways to engage with your government, uh, particularly the science and technology sections of the government, you know, however it's, cl it's classified, to let them know of, of what special capabilities and, and, um, and, and qualifications you can bring to the fore. Here in the U.S., we really emphasize public-private partnerships. NASA was a, a leader in trying to help foster the development of a commercial space industry. Uh, one of our biggest challenges during my tenure as the NASA administrator was to facilitate the success of commercial space entities. And today, if you look at companies like SpaceX or Orbital ATK, formerly Orbital ATK, now Northrop Grumman, uh, or Blue Origin, uh, you will find that they're highly successful because they are competing now to be the service provider for NASA, for a major government entity that decided some time ago that we would no longer take on the responsibility of finding ways to transport people and things to and from space. Today, NASA purchases that service. So if we wanna send an astronaut or cargo to the International Space Station, we literally go to one of our commercial partners, whether it's uh, SpaceX or Boeing or, or Northrop Grumman or Sierra Nevada or any of another, uh, any another groups of, of commercial providers and tell them that we have this much cargo or pretty soon we're gonna tell them we have three astronauts or four astronauts that we wanna to get to the International Space Station. We negotiate a, a, a deal and, uh, and we sign a contract and they provide that service to get things and people to and from space for us. Uh, we have tremendous partners today in the Russians, uh, the 20 some odd member nations of the European Space Agency, uh, the Japan Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, they're all partners on the International Space Station. But as we prepare now to move into the decade of the 20s, where the emphasis for the space communities is to begin to move out to uh, continued exploration of, of the moon, particularly returning humans to the lunar surface. Uh, if we're gonna do that successfully, it's gonna take every bit of effort that we can to, to collaborate both with the private sector and our international partners. And with the ultimate goal being in the decade of the 2030s to move on out to Mars with human beings. Um, we're getting incredible results from our robotic exploration of Mars and other planets in our solar system. 
not to mention planets that we're now finding outside of the solar system uh, in other galaxies. Uh, it's, it's incredible the things that we're able to do today because of the, the integration of commercial capability with government capability. So I think that's the message I wanna, I wanna bring this morning. Uh, before I stop and, and let us move on to the panel, um, let me offer a couple of uh, pieces. It's not advice at all, uh, but, but a, piece, a couple of pieces of lessons I learned in my capacity as the NASA administrator. The number one word in my vocabulary is always uh, and, and I say that's my favorite word or my number one word, because if you don't know why it is that your company or your country or your organization is undertaking whatever it is you're gonna do, you're gonna flail around uh, a while, particularly if you are dependent on someone else to provide major funding for you. So, so understand the why of what you wanna do it. Today, uh, when we look at agencies, the European Space Agency, Roscosmos, JAXA, the Canadian Space Agency, and we work on the International Space Station, when people ask us why we do it, we tell them because we're trying to make this planet on which we live better. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about settlements in other places in the, in the solar system of the universe. You're living on it. Uh, we are living on it, and we need to take care of it. So as we go through the rest of this conference and we go through our panel, I hope we can talk about some of the things that can be done with the, the public-private partnerships that, that we enable. Uh, thanks again for allowing me to be a part of this panel. And, and Dr. Mansami, let, uh, let me pass it back to you so that uh, we can get on with the discussion. Hey, thank you, General Bolden, for the, that uh, presentation and those wise words. And I think, uh, I'm not sure, uh, are you gonna stay on? I am, I am with you for the duration, whether okay, you like perfect. it or not. Okay, so <laughs> we'll see you lingering in the background. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm gonna take, uh, first of all, ask the panelists to come on, uh, up on stage. Um, so if you can just join me. And then I'll just uh, do a quick presentation just to introduce the session and the expectations. Can we have the presentation up? Is there a click there? General Bolden, we've just got a small technical problem. We'll have to kill the, the link. I'm going to do the presentation and bring you back immediately after that. Okay, thank you.
Okay, thank, thank you for that. So I just wanted to introduce the problem statement to the panelists so that you know exactly what we're looking for. So there's two friends. Is this not working? So there's two friends that decide to meet for coffee and recap on the old times. Um, and so they reminisce about the past and obviously the fun that they had during the, 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 the earlier life, um, during the earlier lifespan. So as they're having this conversation, and given the fact that they've matured over the, you know, the years, the conversations start to get a bit more serious. And then they reflect on the next slide. On the state of nature as it currently stands, and that if things progress along the current trajectory, the state of the earth, the prognosis for the future is not very promising. And so the conversation is, how do they arrest the situation? And in the conversation, they figure out that the earth is a complex system. And a decision that's made on one aspect relating to the earth has several sometimes unintended consequences on several other factors. So if you have to address issues around you know, the, the, this complex system, you have to look at systems thinking. But then they hit on a, an absurd, absurd rumor that actually space science and technology can help. Because to understand this complex system, you have to observe the system and make choices and also monitor whether the choices are effective or not. Okay? And so they figure out that space applications, products, technologies can actually help them in their mission. And so while they're having this conversation, they do a, a search on the internet using Sniffer, which is the equivalent of Google. And they come across this conference that's happening in Morocco called GLEC 2019, where the experts are convening. And interestingly enough, the conference is focusing on emerging nations. And what I didn't tell you is that the tortoise is from Tortoise Novakia, and the hare is from Romania. And they are two emerging countries. And so they're very interested in this conversation. And they've just heard the first part of Plenary One, where they've heard from the representatives of space agencies in terms of how the agencies have positioned themselves. And so taking note from the first part of Plenary One, they figure out that probably what they could do quite quickly, because they now both are senior government representatives in their respective countries. And they could effectively set up a space agency. But there's something missing in that conversation, because it's not easy, they realize, is where does industry fit in all of this? So as government, we can set up the agency, but what's the role of industry with regards to the space agency? And what's the role of the agency versus the industry? And so they have three questions that they would like answered. And the first question is, what is the role of the industry in emerging countries? And how can we structure public-private partnerships that General Bolden just mentioned in emerging countries? And I wanted to say this very specifically. The state of industry in developed nations is very different from emerging nations. A big part of emerging nations is informal trade not formal trade as we probably know it in this room. So how do you operate in that environment? The second is there's this big buzz around the fourth industrial revolution and the digital economy. And if they're going to make any significant progress, how do they incorporate the fourth industrial revolution? And both the tortoise and the hare have been in Paris in 2015 and they signed up to the Agenda 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. And so they will also want to know how do they bridge this gap, not only in the fourth industrial revolution, but addressing the sustainable development goals. But they also realize that to make this effective and sustainable, that they have to ensure effective localization of the technologies. 
and applications, and not just importing technologies and products and services, but how do they localize this and embed it in their own decision-making system? And they would like the industry to answer these three questions, effectively. And the answers that you give them is going to be very important as to how this fable or this story ends. Uh, because you'll notice that in Totus Slovakia, they take things very slow and there's a measured approach. Whereas in Her Romania, they get excited about everything and anything. Anything goes, okay? So they're both emerging countries, but the culture is very different. So how do you propose giving them advice as emerging countries to adopt space science and technology and, 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 and technology and applications into their space programs as they're starting out? So with that in mind, in terms of setting the expectations, I just want to move over to the, uh, the panelists. I've got a quite esteemed group of panelists. But I noticed there's one thing that you guys have forgotten. There's no ladies. So you guys need to transform the industry as well. So it's my pleasure to firstly introduce the first uh, panel member, who's the Kyle Asierno, who's the Vice President for Global Sales at iSpace Incorporated in Japan. So each of you have five minutes to introduce yourself and what you do, and the perspective I've just put out in terms of the emerging countries and the role of industry. Thank you very much, Val. And uh, I have my coffee here, <laughs> so. Yes. I, will, I will start by having a bit of a conversation and telling you a little bit of a story. So iSpace is a lunar exploration company, and we're focused on developing micro-robotic technology to expand our presence beyond Earth. In uh, December of 2017, we raised a record 95 million US dollars to develop a spacecraft which will transport payloads, scientific instruments, or other devices from space to the lunar surface. And ultimately, our main objective is to utilize the resources on the lunar surface to expand human settlement. So when I was preparing for my speech today, I, I had to ask myself uh, a philosophical or almost an ethical question. Is it, is it right for me as a, as a salesman to go to emerging countries, countries that have a lot of domestic problems potentially, and ask them to use some of their limited budget in order to invest in space exploration, in lunar exploration. And I, th I thought about this for a really long time. And the answer is resoundingly yes, for three particular reasons. So first, we looked at all of the sustainable development goals, and we found that lunar exploration helps to solve almost every single one of them. And you have to be a little bit creative, for sure. For example, one of the sustainable development goals is life in the sea. How does lunar exploration help life in the sea? Well, I can tell you that Right now, the Mayan community is moving two directions. It's moving deeper and deeper into the planetary ground, or it's also moving towards the oceans. And if you have a choice to mine the oceans or mine the moon, well, I think mining the moon is probably a lot better for the life in the ocean. One of the rising stars in the space industry is Luxembourg. Now, Luxembourg, 50 years ago, was an emerging country. It was an economy that was based upon steel. And it focused most of its energy on steel. But unfortunately, during the steel crash, the whole country almost went bankrupt. And this was a relatively poor country in Europe. But Luxembourg decided that they wanted to diversify their economy, that they wanted to do something new. And in the early 80s, they started to invest in something crazy. Satellites in space, telecommunications. At this time, everybody 
thought this was crazy. Why would you invest in providing communications, satellite communications? We have our three channels. We don't need any more TV. But Luxembourg thought that in 20 years, there's going to be a huge demand for this, this resource. And they put 5% of their GDP on the line to send the first commercial satellite into space. Today, Luxembourg makes an annual revenue of over $2 billion from SES, which is one of the la largest satellite te telecommunication providers that exists on the planet. So they, they made a crazy risk a long time ago in an emerging market that wasn't really well understood, but they're really making a lot of money from that now. When I, when I think about the way that the space sector is developing, it's very obvious that now there's a huge push towards the moon. And it's not just NASA. There are new space agencies from around the planet that are developing their own programs and producing their own funds to help their industry go to the moon. Canada, Australia, UAE, even Greece now is looking at ways that they can find ways for lunar exploration. And the main reason is because they see an opportunity to benefit from future commercial activities on the lunar surface. They see a way to help solve some of the sustainability goals. And maybe most importantly, they see it as a way to inspire their people. And when Dr. Bolden was talking about the three reasons why, I think those are three really important reasons. And I think that in the future, all of the emerging countries that are here today, you should really consider how lunar exploration can help your country to move into the next generation of exploration, to join the developed countries at this exploration table because the conversations are happening today. And if you wanna be a part of that table, if you wanna be at that table, you have to join the conversation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kyle, for that insight. So the next speaker is uh, Bruce Chesley, who's the Senior Director for Strategy, Space and Missile Systems at the Boeing Company in the United States. Uh, Bruce. Thanks, Val. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you today, and it's a privilege for me to represent Boeing Space and Launch, which, uh, of course, is a part of the world's largest aerospace company, uh, Boeing. And I was uh, pleased to hear uh, uh, Minister El Alawi this morning talk about aviation as a potential precursor for space in, um, in emerging countries in general and in the Kingdom of Morocco in particular. And I thought I would elaborate on the activities that Boeing has done in the aviation sector here in Morocco uh, as, as a, you know, perhaps an example of some of the specifics that can be undertaken in emerging countries um, relative to space. Um, and first of all, um, uh, you know, I guess one element of it, Val, is it's, uh, it's definitely a tortoise kind of a race. Uh, you know, Boeing's first presence in the kingdom was 50 years ago. Uh, you know, we started with uh, Boeing 727 airplanes. Um, and the first uh, joint venture that Boeing established in the kingdom of Morocco is uh, uh, well over 15 years old, actually probably closer to 20 years old. Um, in the, in the recent uh, times, about two, two and a half years ago, um, the Kingdom of Morocco and Boeing entered into a memorandum of understanding to really accelerate the uh, growth of capabilities and uh, economic benefit uh, in the aviation sector here in Morocco. Um, and at that time, a goal was set out that by 2028, there's going to be um, more than 8,700 new jobs in the aviation sector in Morocco and an economic impact of greater than a billion dollars a year uh, at that time frame. And, uh, and in order to enable that, there's an ongoing set of discussions and dialogues and incentives and tax breaks and technology transfer and training. Um, and and uh, you know, so it is a complex system. You know, it requires systems thinking, as as Val also rightly pointed out. There's not one single intervention that can create that kind of economic benefit. 
it takes a coordinated effort and um, deliberate planning across all of those elements in order to achieve uh, those kinds of ambitious goals of you know a billion dollars a year a year of economic impact. <laughs> I suppose there's one element that really hasn't even been talked about that much uh, through the course of the morning, and that's uh, the role of NGOs, mm -hmm. non-governmental organizations, and, and uh, one uh, element that Boeing is proud to be a part of uh, with many other partners I in Morocco and extending out across the region is um, uh, Education for Employment, EFD Morocco. And uh, you know that, that's another important aspect of preparing the workforce uh, and, and uh, the local population to participate in, uh, in this uh, emerging uh, market sector. Um, so, you know, kind of to wrap it up, it, it, the goals that were established two and a half years ago and the projections of what it was gonna take in order to achieve that economic impact, you know, there's been over 2,200 new jobs that have been created and economic impact is ahead of the plan for a billion dollars of impact in 2028. So uh, the capabilities are there. It requires that kind of system thinking and, and broad approach. Um, and, but I think you know, the possibilities for the space sector uh, are pretty promising as well. And so with that, I look forward to the comments from the other panelists. Thanks, Bruce, that was very interesting. Um, the next panelist is Luigi Scatea. He's the director of space in Price Waterhouse in Cooper uh, Advisory with France. Luigi. Thanks a lot. Um, so I guess today I'll probably bring in the perspective of the professional service industry, since I'm possibly the only one at the, uh, the panel today uh, from this type of industry. Um, so this morning there's been mention of the wide socioeconomic benefits that space bring to uh, uh, every country that invests into space activities. And it has been mentioned also uh, uh, the importance to monitor and evaluate um, the, the results and the impacts from implementing specific space policy. So a first specific role that I see from, for a company like ours uh, in, uh, in assisting emerging countries is indeed in the execution of assessment of societal and economic impacts. So it's particularly important to continue carrying out assessments, either ex post and ex ante, uh, and doing, in doing so it's important not to disregard uh, societal benefits that are not economic in nature and that are not easily quantifiable. It's also particularly important to do so uh, with transparency. So the methodologies to be used need to be widely recognized, easily relatable, it's important to communicate not only on the final number as a black box, but to give a wider perspective because people need to be able to relate to it. So this can contribute to the monitoring aspects and it can contribute also to the raising awareness aspects. Because when you can bring in uh, an assessment of impacts that can be compared to analogous assessments in other industrial sector, then you can have a solid arguments towards uh, decision makers. Um, the second role I see for, uh, uh, for a company like ours, for, uh, for an industry like ours, uh, in supporting development is in contributing to informed uh, industrial policy making. Because when you carry out uh, uh, societal and economic impact assessments, when you uh, map the industry in a particular country, when you take into account all the cultural aspects that have been mentioned earlier in the, uh, uh, the, the Tortoise and Hair uh, uh, presentation, in the end, it's, uh, it's quite clear that you will have an understanding of what are the levers you can use in order to focus your investments and in order to make sure that you can maximize uh, the return in your country. So that's also something that um, we believe it's particularly important uh, for emerging countries. Of course, we also realize that emerging countries might have not always uh, uh, all the means to, to carry out this, this type of activities. So since we have really um, done in the last uh, five years more than 30 uh, social economic impact assessments in the space sectors, in all space domains, uh, many of them are, are actually uh, public, uh, publicly available. So we encourage everybody interested to get in touch with us because we are happy to share uh, um, every publicly available data that we have. Maybe it's not always obvious where to find them, uh, even if uh, um, they are their public reports. Uh, the third and final role that I think and the third contribution I think we can bring to the tab table is towards capacity building. 
So it has been mentioned the need to, uh, to use whatever space assets are uh, built and, uh, and uh, developed in emerging countries. There is a need to then generate uh, business and activities or uh, societal activities uh, uh, with the space assets. Uh, what a company like us can bring to the table is a, a wider reach, a huge network that involves a, a reach to other industries. So we can involve other industries into the game, we can provide uh, access and support to literally <laughs> every country in the world, and we can also support in the actual capacity building, because we have a, a sense of how space works and what are the impacts that space can bring in several businesses, so we can derive use cases and help uh, prototyping applications as well. So this can be uh, um, also a role uh, that, uh, that we see, and that's something that uh, um, we are doing in, uh, specifically right now in a, in a project uh, uh, that is dedicated to fragile states. So it's targeting countries here in Africa as well. So that's it. Thank you, Luigi. The next panelist is Jean-Luc uh, Legault. Uh, he's the chief executive officer of Palace Alenia Space, which is based in France. John. Yes, good morning. Good morning to everybody. Uh, first, let's, uh, because you spoke about uh, the lack of female panelists, uh, let's uh, tell you that uh, in my company of 9,000 people, there are 40 percent female engineers. Uh, so it's a lot, and I can t tell you that both, uh, both female engineers are uh, extremely, extremely efficient. So they are not here today. Huh? They told me, uh, Jean-Louis CEO, you are better to speak than to develop satellites. <laughs> so go to represent uh, our company. Um, so uh, Dr. Bolden uh, spoke about, uh, uh, spoke about uh, the why, and I think it, it's important. So let, let me share first with you what is the purpose of uh, of my company that was uh, uh, chosen with all the employees, the purpose is space for life. And our vision is that uh, space uh, is the main lever for humankind uh, to have a better and more sustainable life on Earth. And uh, um, when we are developing satellites, be telecom, navigation, observation, exploration, scientific satellite, we try, the employees try never to forget this, uh, this vision that we are trying to make uh, life on Earth better. And I think that it's very linked uh, to the purpose and to the objective of the, of the conference, uh, conference today. When we are speaking uh, of emerging countries and uh, the support and the use of space for emerging countries, I have at least three, three years in mind. The first one, probably the most obvious, is a, a telecom satellite in order uh, to fix the digital divide in, uh, in a lot of uh, countries, not only emerging countries, but also European countries, uh, France, I'm a French guy, and I can tell you that there are a lot of uh, French people that today have no access to high-speed internet in, in, uh, in the mountains and in the secluded part of France. Uh, so it's clear that uh, even if you want to provide only two megabytes a second per, uh, per user, and if you target one million uh, users, for example, in a country, now the technology of telecom satellite can provide, can, can provide the, the, the solution. And uh, we, my company, has provided the, the solution to a lot of countries with what we call VHTS satellites. Uh, I had the chance uh, two weeks ago to, to be uh, in Bangladesh and we, we launched a satellite uh, less than one year ago in Bangladesh and I had, uh, and I had uh, a meeting with a minister and he told me that in less than one, one year uh, the uh, level of e-education has been multiplied by a factor of 50 in Bangladesh in all schools of Bangladesh. If we know that, uh, and I think that we all admit that education is a key lever for economic, for future economic growth, uh, we see that uh, uh, 
telecom satellites can, can bring a lot. And obviously, I'm not speaking of e-medicine. E e I'm not speaking of uh, e-government uh, services. Uh, I can speak of e-business because we have a digital uh, revolution. Now, uh, companies have no longer the need to be in big cities. They can be in very small villages or small towns. It, and the only thing that they need is high speed, high speed connection to the world and to make their business, their sales and marketing through high speed internet. So you can develop uh, the industry, you can develop the economy also through those uh, telecom satellites. Second example, obviously, is, and it was mentioned several times this morning, are the observation, observation satellites. We had the pleasure with my colleagues of uh, Airbus close to me, we had the pleasure to deliver two satellites to uh, Morocco that we launched two years ago and one year ago. And this satellite will be used for dual use, obviously some defense use, but also for a lot of civilian use in the field of uh, agriculture and fishery. Once again, just one example and one anecdote. Last Sunday I was in a big Asian country and I had a meeting with the uh, Minister of Agriculture and he told me that uh, thanks to observation satellites, the productivity of the management of crops have been increased by a factor of two in this country. And if you, include, in, if you increase the productivity, obviously you increase the competitiveness of your industry and you increase the business that you do on the export uh, market. So those are two, two examples, two very concrete examples of uh, uh, what uh, satellites and what space can bring to the economy of a country. And I could also speak, but maybe in another question, on future IoT satellites, because I think that uh, those kind of satellites will also help a lot of industry, a lot of businesses, in order to be more efficient tomorrow and in order to grow the economy of their country. Thank you. The next panelist, okay, I got the order wrong. Uh, sorry, I don't have your name on the list. <laughs> sorry. O Oliver, you can have it. Oliver, thank you very much. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> we have a mystery guest on the panel. <laughs> so I think one of the important points that has not been raised yet this morning or in the discussions is there is a space life without governments. This is the industrial panel, and there is some domains where industry is very successfully working without the support of governments and doing private business in space. Um, telecommunications is the best example of that. You don't have to wait for a new space to see that there is a commercial approach to space. Um, we're probably doing this in the 80s, successfully, more and more digitalized. Jean-Luc was mentioning uh, some of the satellites that we have been providing also in uh, emerging countries. One other example is um, the OneWeb constellation. You've rightfully named it the access to internet. This so-called other three or four billion which are currently not having this access, that would be one of the first points to be tackled. Now, as an emerging country, you don't have to invest public money into your own constellation. You can benefit from the investments that have been done on the private side. Of course, private-public partnerships are subject for discussion and must make sense, but I think the first takeaway from that is don't only look at what your country could do in terms of government and agency space problems, Think about how you can help your own industry, startups, to work and collaborate with established players around the globe as quick as possible. Since a lot of things are data fueled today, this is easier than one could think. And as we just learned, to work from remote places, if you have connectivity, shouldn't be that problem anymore, such that there is an easier access to be part of the new economy than definitely it was 10, 20 years ago. This is one very important takeaway. 
Now, telecommunication, we talked about Earth observation, having you know, pictures, imagery of the Earth, of your environment. Let's also talk about navigation. Let's talk about the difference that navigation, the ecosystem, is also making here in Africa. I think if you have all these elements, connectivity, the navigation, where not only it is your precise position, but also the timing, if we talk about industrialization, automization, that you're always everywhere on, an, on a precise timing signal, this is all enablers for your economy. And you need to find ways to get access to that. And this can be done in various ways. This can be by joining ESA in larger programs, like Galileo, like other large programs, and benefiting from those invests. This can also be by having your own and individual investment into space. But eventually, it is about the people. It is about the knowledge of the people and giving your people access to the knowledge that is developing and evolving in an incredible speed, significantly quicker than it had been over the last centuries, driven by and fueled by digitalization. So think about how to enable things that you can have an ecosystem in your country that is growing. Just to poke briefly on Moon, Sometimes moon and exploration seems to be a little bit besides what, let's say, the useful space is doing for Earth. Honestly, I don't think so. The moon for me, or exploration, it's almost like the logical continuation of an expansion process. If you think about what happened when people set sails in Europe to go and settle in America, now, they didn't stick to the East Coast, they went forward to the West Coast. And when they went to the West Coast, they wouldn't return and say, we've been here and that's enough for now. If you take a look at today, the center of gravity of a new economy is exactly there. So sometimes we don't know exactly why we're going there, but we know that it opens up new opportunities. And I believe that companies like Space IL, also what NASA is doing, what Airbus is doing, what others are doing, which is this step ahead, this little bit more visionary, with a lot of support of the governments, in order to open up new opportunities, and then we will see what we will evolve from that. And I think that space and deeper space will be the next cyberspace, and will be connected to it. So, if you want my forecast, everything that you have today on Earth, you will have in low Earth orbit in the near future. And everything that you have in the low Earth orbit today, you will have around the moon, connecting the moon to the Earth-moon system and enabling us to do business. And we may not even know what it is. I may not even know what it is. And your people may find out quicker than those developed countries that think they know it all today. So, you know, enable your people to think about it and come up with new solutions and help them do their business. Thanks. Thanks, Oliver, for that. Um, the next uh, panelist is Stuart Martin. He's the CEO and Executive Director of the Space Applications Catapult in the United Kingdom. Stuart. Thank you, Val, and thank you to all the organizers for the opportunity to uh, uh, speak today at, uh, at this fantastic conference. Um, I'll start, if I may, just by saying a little bit about the Satellite Applications Catapult, because not everyone may be familiar with us. Uh, we are an organization that was set up by the British government six years ago to facilitate the growth of the satellite application sector. So, you know, in, in the terminology we've already heard uh, today, we are very much uh, rooted in the downstream, in the applications part of the, uh, of the space industry. Um, but you, you might ask, why then are we sitting on an industry panel if we were set up by the government? Uh, well, we were set up to operate as a private organization to, to use the, uh, the tools and the, the, the opportunities that business has and to be active in the innovation ecosystem. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and so now, six years on, only about a third of our income comes from that sort of uh, principal government relationship. The rest of it comes from uh, other partnerships with the private and the, the, the public sector. Uh, so active as, as we are in the innovation landscape, the, the thing that we learn quickly is that you know, technology is only one part of innovation. There are very many other barriers to uh, taking new products and services to market and getting them adopted in the marketplace. 
They range from things like um, the, the lack of awareness or the lack of willing to accept what space technology can do. They include things like regulatory biases, uh, policy biases, uh, and, and of course you have the incumbencies of, uh, of existing technologies that uh, are, are looking to protect themselves against incoming new technologies. And so it was, you know, I've, I found it really exciting when in 2015 the Sustainable Development Goals were published, which I very much saw as a call to arms for the space sector, because here we had a clearly articulated set of requirements for the world which the space sector could respond to. Uh, and if we look forward to the 2030 time frame, which is the, you know, the time frame where these uh, development goals are due to be resolved or to be tackled, uh, then I, my, my sincere wish is that, you know, at that point, the, the heroes of the space industry that we are talking about are those amongst us who've managed to harness the power of space technology in order to tackle some of these intractable global challenges that, that we're all so familiar with today. Uh, and uh, and uh, as well as, I'm sure some people have gone to Mars and the Moon by then, but I think I I if we don't, then I think, you know, we should be ashamed of ourselves as a sector because this is really something that we should be focusing on. Key word in the Sustainable Development Goals is sustainable. And we all think of environmental sustainability when we talk about sustainability. Um, but as important, if not more important, is the economic sustainability. And that is the challenge for all of us. You know, we've got to find new ways of making the space sector economically sustainable. Uh, and that means We've got to get the solutions that tackle these goals embedded into the economic framework of society. It can't be just about uh, governments paying industry to deliver services in the way that the sector has perhaps got used to operating in the past. Uh, I've heard the term PPP described by some government agencies as public plays private. I think we've got to get uh, a much more creative way of working between government and industry in the years ahead. And I think the secret to that is, I mean, we're, we're talking here about space agencies and the space industry. We've got to broaden the community that we talk about space with to include the non-space sector. We've got to be much better as an industry at getting ourselves embedded into the supply chains of the non-space sector uh, and also providing services, as, like the one we just heard about in, uh, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, to the non-space agency parts of government. Uh, and, and it's only when we do that that we're really going to be able to um, uh, live up to some of our some of the potential that we have, and so you know I, I think there are many ways in which the developing world has advantages over the developed world. Uh, I talked about some of the barriers to innovation that we see uh, uh, working at the catapult. Some of those impediments, very many of those impediments, particularly around uh, incumbent technologies, uh, the, the the way that uh, ex existing ways of working prevent new technologies from coming through, very often that doesn't exist in the developing world. So it, it creates a blank canvas for the space uh, industry globally to try out new technologies and to get uh, a new economy or a new ways of thinking about how the way space technology can be worked. So I think there's, you know, the, 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 the developed, de developed space industry in particular needs the developing space industry at least as much as it is the other way around. And if we're able to develop these partnerships that embrace the government, or all flavors of it, and industry, all flavors of it, successfully, then I think we've all got a great future ahead. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stuart. Uh, the next panelist is C.S. Mostert. He's the Managing Director of Space Commercial Services Holding in South Africa. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Val. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having the opportunity to speak from a, a small industry player, if that is the right word, in, in, from Africa. Uh, and maybe I should shed some light on how we came to existence, because I think it's helpful for a country to know where to start with investment. So, so we, we started out as an investment by the South African government, the pre-'94 government, into creating human capital for their, uh, at that time, classified space program. And then we didn't know how to stop. So in, uh, in the 90s, we built a small microsatellite that was inspired by using commercial off-the-shelf technology. So we managed to, uh, in a very small satellite at the time, 64 kilograms, 
achieve a 12 meter multispectral resolution. Um, and that attracted some international attention. We uh, supplied uh, components from our satellites to South Korea, to Australia, for a number of missions. And then we attracted so much attention that people said that they would like to do the same thing. So we founded a company called Sunspace in 2000. Sunspace went on to uh, build uh, a few satellites. Um, some of them are publicly well, well known, like Sumantila Sat. Um, and then in 2008, I uh, was convinced of the fact that it's not about building satellites, yes, we still build satellites, but it's about using the satellites. How do you apply the capability of these satellites? And then we founded uh, Space Commercial Services, SES, in June of 2008. It's now with the goal of, of commercializing space technology. Uh, maybe at the, we were a bit early for our time, I don't, I don't know. Um, today, we, the bulk of our activities uh, are still related to uh, know-how transfer, helping people to build satellites. Um, and we've tried to, to work with emerging countries in a way to, uh, to f let's call it, fractionate infrastructure. Because one, one satellite can only do so little. So uh, we started with the African Resource Management Constellation, a political alliance between South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and Algeria. Um, and it turns out, that was already in 2003, and it turns out that to do a political, multilateral political project is a, is a senior assignment. Um, <laughs> this, uh, the agreement between the countries was signed in 2009 um, after alignment around user requirements and technical details. However, since then, the only thing that transpired was that each of the countries motivated for their satellite budgets based on the ARMC. It's actually really difficult to get it right, and that's why I'm a, a supporter of the African Space Agency, because that's a place where there's full-time people assigned to achieve multilateral agreements. So today, we are still working with emerging countries, and we have uh, started, looked at the advances in technology, the miniaturization, standardization, and it's really opened up the space in a way that today you can build a constellation for the price of a national <coughs> program 10, 15 years ago. Um, and, that, and that key we are using to create a number of constellations where a country can invest in the space program and get all the benefit that has been uh, espoused. But at the same time, the investment is in the, in the real economy of, of the day. So there's a, num there's a focus on agriculture, uh, the hyperfarm constellation, there's a focus on maritime domain. Africa has got 13 million square kilometers of, of, uh, of controlled ocean. If it was controlled, it could do a good 10 to 20 percent better in terms of its revenue from the ocean. Um, and there's a, there was, uh, just two weeks ago, there was an emergency response uh, constellation was announced in the UK. Um, so these, are, these constellations gives an emerging country the opportunity to participate as a contributing member uh, with, with a national satellite or a number of national satellites and get the benefit of that particular economic function uh, fractionated from a global infrastructure basis down to a local country level. So today, Africa's got 20% of the land mass in the world, but only 3% of the economy. So I see a very big growth market um, in this way for Africa in the future. Thank you. Thanks, yes. And the last but not least the panelist expert is uh, Vitaly Safanov. He's the Deputy Director General for uh, JSC GLEF Cosmos in the Russian Federation. Thank you very much. Good, Good afternoon, time. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so probably I would uh, tell a few words about uh, GLEF Cosmos, uh, what we are doing, and we'll try to link it uh, to socioeconomic benefits to countries that we can do. So GLEF Cosmos is a daughter company of Roscosmos State Space Corporation. Uh, it was established 34 years ago with the scope to promote uh, Russian, Soviet at that time, uh, space achievement to the world uh, and promote international cooperation in space area. So uh, today what we are doing? Uh, I will stra start from a manned space flight, surprisingly. Um, uh, it's not only commercial tourism for rich people that want to go to space, 
of course they are also always welcomed, but uh, it's more about national space uh, program, national human space programs. Uh, today we are working with um, our partners from United Arab Emirates, with other countries, uh, in developing, helping to develop them uh, their space programs in manned space area. Uh, you could ask uh, why, uh, uh, why it's uh, uh, so important uh, in social economic benefits, and uh, I would answer that uh, the national manned space programs give an enormous impulse, uh, unite nations, enormous impulse for for space interest to young people. Uh, the young people choose a profession related to space, engineers, uh, managers in space area, and later become uh, uh, founders or create startups. So they work in the space area and uh, develop social programs, so space programs in uh, your countries. So uh, then what else? Launch services, our daughter company, GK Launch Services, which representative today is also here, by the way. Uh, our daughter company provide uh, launch services based on Soyuz launch vehicle. And uh, why it is uh, one of the most reliable launch vehicle in the world. Uh, so why it is uh, important to have a reliable access to space? You all know that uh, starting from commercial project uh, uh, to universities programs, uh, the launching of satellite, uh, it's like a scope of life for that people who cre creates this project. Uh, and uh, thanks to Soyuz, we can uh, offer a reliable launch vehicle to, to everybody. Uh, we are also an official distributor of Earth observation data from a Russian constellation of satellites. Uh, today, there were a lot of words about importance of EO data today in our lives, so I wouldn't repeat it. And uh, the last but not least, what I should mention, so when I was preparing to the session, I tried to ask myself what is the most important contribution that we, that the industry, uh, that uh, countries that have uh, developed space industries could do to socioeconomic benefits of emerging <coughs> countries. And the answer gave me my children. So two, several weeks ago, uh, there were anniversary of uh, first uh, um, of flight of sp first man to space of Yuri Gagarin. And I was telling the, the story. Uh, and I saw their eyes, their great interest in space. Uh, and uh, we, of course, uh, today trying uh, to develop special programs starting from <coughs> pupils to students and for professionalists also uh, based on Russian universities, Russian industries. Uh, so, and um, to my mind, this is the most important investment in human capital that we can do. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Vitale. So this has been a, a fascinating uh, conversation. I just have a few questions um, that kind of cropped up as you were uh, talking through your various initiatives. So I picked up from Bruce and John specifically, you've got a footprint in Morocco, okay? And the same question probably goes to Oliver as well. So when you're working with the emerging countries and developing countries, um, I think there's a misconception that to, have a, to be space enabled, you need access to your own satellite, okay? Now in Africa, we have a unique situation. We have 55 countries. Like, can you imagine 55 countries having satellites of their own? So how do you change or look at your business model going forward as opposed to targeting individual countries? Just look at it from a regional perspective. And I think Sias mentioned multilateral uh, cooperation. For example, I think you were mentioning the African Resource Management Constellation, which is a challenge. But how do countries in the developed world work differently in this sort of a regional perspective? And this comes to the issue around localization that I mentioned in my introduction. 
Oops. Yeah, um, I guess one comment on that is, yeah, each country can't represent a complete ecosystem necessarily for, uh, for the space sector. And so um, it becomes a, um, a, a dialogue and a, um, a discussion around nurturing what are the unique capabilities that, um, that each region or each country or uh, each locality is going to um, nurture and develop and create value around. And then ultimately, it, it is about that localization of the, you know, that combination of, of the entire ecosystem coming together to create that spark where value is created and, and um, economic development thrives on its own uh, and uh, you know, generates revenue and value and education and all the positive benefits that we've been talking about. So maybe that's one thought and I'll, okay. I'll turn it over for others. Sure. Your, your thoughts? Okay, so you, you are making uh, things even more complicated by your, by your question because uh, when you, you deal with uh, emerging countries or other countries, it's uh, already difficult to launch a, a, space, a space program uh, because governments have, have to do a, a, lot, a lot of things and obviously when uh, different countries are involved, it becomes even a, a little bit more difficult. Uh, difficult. Having said that, uh, we had some examples where two or three countries in Middle East, for example, have decided to launch uh, a joint, uh, a joint, uh, joint programs and sharing uh, sharing assets, uh, space assets uh, between the different uh, countries. Obviously, they they find the, the right uh, financial model uh, uh, in front of the, the industry in order to uh, to uh, invest invest uh, infra infrastructure. So uh, it could be it could be it could be. Uh, a solution. Another solution, obviously, is, uh, is services. Uh, uh, if you if you don't want to have your uh, uh, proprietary uh, space uh, space assets, a good, a really good solution, obviously, uh, and probably the most uh, uh, cheapest solution is, is to is to bring uh, uh, services to bring either images or applications based on images or a part of a part of bandwidth. Of some uh, some satellites, be geo or non-geo satellite, uh, to uh, to to industry, and uh, now there are a lot of industries that are uh, obviously developing their service <coughs> business, uh, which obviously will grow uh, at a, at a bigger pace than the infrastructure business or industry. Okay, thanks, Sean. Oliver, any additions to that? Maybe just to add that. Indeed, it is not on, on industry to explain individual countries what is their need. I think it is our job to explain what is possible and, and firms like the Jack here are very well capable of distributing that message and then listening and, and, and precisely understanding what is the individual why. But due to the global nature of space, there are patterns that can be identified and then uh, I think it is a good idea to think in services and to think in stepwise evolution. So very often we have the chance to see patterns where we can propose models where you start developing your skills based on the exploitation of data of existing infrastructure and then you're increasing the performance like for instance adding a downlink station in your vicinity which gives you better access to data in better real time, if you want, and it may eventually lead to your own assets. And then we can offer in return also models where you have the chance to share these assets with others. So I think this is very well possible for a lot of topics, but um, the, the most important thing is that we cannot dictate the why. This is what everybody individually needs to find out, and now we can identify these patterns and help uh, propose optimum solutions to have the best value for the money. Now, this is Charlie. Can I add one thing, uh, just some of the things that, that, that uh, Oliver has talked about? Sorry, General Bolden, I didn't get that. No, I, I just wanted to add a comment to something that Oliver uh, has been mentioning. You know, as we look at the businesses represented there in the room, my guess is you've probably got some of the startups 
to which Oliver referred when he said that, you know, if we want, if we really want to have space without governments, then we've got to make room for the startups. One of the techniques that we use in NASA, which is very successful, is a program we call Mentor Protege, uh, where we put into NASA contracts a requirement that large space companies, companies that traditionally work with NASA, had to go out and find a small business uh, that was interested in working in, spa in the space arena, but didn't exactly know how to negotiate the, the world of government contracts and the like. So I, I, would, I would throw that out as an idea that, that you all might discuss sort of in the hallway or at coffee as you, as you leave this session. The other thing would be, um, and I'll echo something you said earlier, if any of you want to be successful, you've got to think seriously about diversity and inclusion in, in your workforce. Uh, I'm like, like you, Val, I'm disappointed that we have all, all men at least in front of everybody. Uh, that's leaving out half the world's population and we can't, we can't survive that way. No, no, thanks, General Bolden. Uh, I share your sentiments. Just by the way, um, in the executive team of uh, the space agency in South Africa, we've got a team of seven people and four of them are women. And I can tell you, it's an exciting room to be in. <laughs> no pressure. Um, which is interesting because I wanted to throw the next question both to General Bolden and uh, Stuart. Um, I, w I was wondering what prompted NASA or you, General Bolden, to look at commercializing the space industry in the US was it necessarily to move the risk appetite from a public sector institution into the private sector? And it comes back to the issue that Stuart uh, mentioned earlier on around you know, the barriers to entry and developed countries or industries actually requiring uh, developing nations. And purely because you're much more agile as the smaller entities and you know, with the larger entities in the developed world, it's, uh, I think we, we talked about the inertia to change is much greater. So, and how do you bring in these, uh, as opposed to just working across a barrier between public sector institutions and um, private sector institutions, how do you work across the barrier between developed and developing nations? So just interesting from your perspective, General Bowling, what prompted you to look at yeah. the commercialization of the industry? And I'll just come back to Stuart on that. Yeah, believe it or not, I think the deciding factor for NASA, uh, we had been looking at privatization for a long, long time, but the deciding factor for us was the Columbia Space Shuttle accident and the result from the Columbia Accident Investigation Board that, that uh, suggested, and it became a mandate, that NASA phase out of, of the shuttle program uh, by 2010. It, it caused Congress to... Uh, to then begin to look at how we could make commercial sec the commercial sector successful. And so they mandated, or it became a law, that um, government could not and cannot compete with the private sector. That if there is a capability that is available in the private sector, uh, government must um, negotiate contracts with that sector to get the service. And that, uh, I think is one of the things that led to the growth, the explosion actually of uh, on orbit um, Earth observations, you know, satellites for communications for Earth observation. And, uh, and actually another thing that Oliver is working in on orbit servicing, that is an area that is, is I think you're gonna see explode once the first company, first commercial company flies a, sec a successful servicing mission, and I expect them within the next couple of years. Thanks for that. I find that very fascinating because there's failure that drove you in a different direction. But I also pointed out earlier on that the representation of emerging countries in the room is, is limited because the culture in emerging countries is very different because the appetite for failure is not tolerated in most instances. Whereas where you come from in your ecosystem, failure is part of the norm. So how do you cross that barrier or break that barrier that failure is an option and it's a learning opportunity rather than uh, a no-go going forward? 
Stuart. Can I come back to your first question? Yeah, yes, that? sure. <laughs> I, I, and I will come to that. I mean, the, the, the issue of why developing the developed world needs the uh, developing world. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll give the example of um, the way that the mobile phone industry really broke out in the sort of late 80s and early 90s, uh, which coincided, as you know, with the, uh, the, the, the coming down of the, you know, the, the, the Berlin Wall and the East-West divide. Uh, and um, now, I was living in Germany at the time, so I had a front row seat to all of this. Uh, and what happened was, as the you know, mobile phone technology was starting to come through, uh, we in the West, we had a pretty good fixed line infrastructure, which we were broadly happy with. We had this new technology, which didn't work very well, very big batteries, and it was pretty unreliable, and we were a bit indifferent as to whether or not this was going to work. Uh, and you know, the industry was reluctant to invest in rolling out the infrastructure that, that, that this system was going to need mm -hmm. in the face of actually you know, not, not a clear demand from their, from their customer base. And at the same time, so that you have the emerging companies coming out from behind the Iron Curtain, and you know, in the West, we think, well, it's going to take them ages to build all the cable and the, the, you know, the, the, the wired systems and the communications infrastructure, because they had no, no communications infrastructure. And they le leapt straight towards the wireless, this new mobile industry that was coming out. And a lot of the investment that was, went into that infrastructure that sort of propelled that whole industry forward came from what was going on behind the Iron Curtain. Mm. And they built up some world-leading industry that was on the applications of that technology. Think people like Skype and I can't even remember. There, there, you know, there's some, some big names that we're all familiar with that grew out of that uh, industrial revolution behind the Iron Curtain all about uh, mobile phone technologies. And for a very long time, they led the rest of the world in the use of that technology. So that's, that's a real concrete example of how, uh, you know, a, a, a technology that the developed world relies on, or is going to rely on, can be really accelerated by a strong partnership with the developing world. And I can see something very similar happening in Spain. Okay, well, thanks. I'll uh, somebody else do the failure question. Okay, <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, I see there's some questions from the floor as well. Uh, if I can just have that up. So the first question, are there any actual programs aimed to helping emerging countries get involved in space applications. Are there any specific programs aimed at helping emerging countries getting involved in space applications? Yes, Stuart. Yeah, I can, I mean, Chris Lee, who was on the, uh, the earlier panel this afternoon, talked about the, uh, the international partnership program that he runs for the UK Space Agency, which we've been involved in a number of those programs. And they are, uh, well, I have to say, a fantastic, fantastic way of getting the UK, in this case, uh, industrial partners in the UK, working with uh, largely uh, user departments or user uh, organizations uh, in the emerging country, but also with their local industry as well, to develop partnerships which are then aimed at providing sustainable delivery of a new product or service at the back end of the, of the program. And uh, we've, we've been doing this for about three or four years now, uh, and uh, very much hoping it's going to continue because it's been very successful in, in building those uh, international and industrial partnerships. Okay. There's another question is, which of the space activities you are involved with generates the most tangible socioeconomic benefit? And I think I want to throw this to Luigi, because you indicated you've done a, a number of uh, socioeconomic benefits assessment, 30 or so. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's, uh, it's difficult to say which, uh, which sector generates the wider socioeconomic activities because every single space domain, so when you go to, from satellite communication to earth observation or even like implementing uh, uh, space situational awareness programs or uh, uh, space exploration and so on, so each one of them generates different types of benefits. So you might have uh, certain programs, like for example, the ones associated with SATCOM or with Earth generating uh, more obvious economic benefits uh, due to the commercial applications uh, coming down the roads. Uh, but in fact, I mean, as I said before, what's important is to look at the, the overall picture, which includes uh, 
knowledge creation, which includes inspira inspirational value, which includes strategic uh, impacts uh, and, and wider benefits at large that are not always quantifiable. So you can't easily make a ranking. Also, um, it also depends by the country and the region that implements it. So certain regions and certain countries are bound to reap more benefits out of certain programs other than others based on their inherent uh, uh, industrial structure and societal structure. Okay. And then my question to CS is, you indicated when you started up your company, um, it was probably not the right time, it was a challenging environment to start up. Um, so as an industry player, sort of in an emerging ecosystem, how do you see the reception from industry in the developed world? Um, is there any, have you had any discussions around partnerships and, and so on? Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So many of the projects that we are working on would not be possible if we did not work with the industry in the developed world. Yeah. That is a way to, uh, to, to phrase it. One of the companies in our group is called uh, New Space Systems and they in fact a supplier of uh, talk rods to the one web constellation. Um, we are also supplying a whole host of other uh, additive control uh, sensors and actuators to a number of missions in the international market. Um, then we also have collaboration missions uh, on the scientific level. We have a, a, a the radio astronomy uh, obser observatory on the far side of the moon at the L2 point, uh, which is uh, managed by a, a Dutch con a Chinese consortium. We are a supplier into that particular mission. So most of the work that we do is impossible if we do not work in a very close collaboration with, with entities within the, the so-called developed world. I want to throw the same question to Kyle as well. Um, as a new entrant in, in, in the sector, do you feel you have to elbow your way with the big boys around the room to get to the top? No. <laughs> I feel like, uh, as was mentioned before, younger, newer companies are a little bit more nimble and we're able to specialize. Uh, we have this niche environment where we're only focused on lunar exploration and thereby there are a lot of partnerships. We can learn so much from uh, some of the bigger primes and there's a lot of programs whereby uh, we can benefit from, let's say, other huge uh, constellations or cooperations that the governments require, where new space and, and larger companies work together. And, and we've already seen that with programs that are created uh, from the European Space Agency, for example. So I feel like there is a lot of room for uh, new space companies. I feel like uh, many of the, the, the government officials here should consider what they can do to inspire younger, uh, entrepreneurs in your country to get involved in space uh, because from what I've seen to this point uh, there's been a tremendous amount of support from the bigger companies to include us in this uh, in this somewhat burgeoning new space industry. Thanks uh, Carl. So we could effectively continue this conversation to the early hours of the morning but I can feel Christian on my right hand side. <laughs> So I'm just going to say a very, uh, a very big thank you to the panelists and also to General Bolden who's joined us uh, online. And I, I think this has been a, a fascinating conversation. And then I'm also hoping this is actually a start of a conversation, not the end of it. So I'm quite looking forward to that as well. So thank you all. And please uh, join me in thanking the, the panelists. Thank you very much, Kamun uh, Sami, for the moderation. May I ask the panelists to just stay with us for a few more minutes because we have, before we move into the coffee break, an important announcement. Um, the announcement, I think, is very applicable also because it is an uh, initiative that will be very interesting for emerging countries. The IEF, in cooperation with uh, GK Lounge Services, we are pleased to announce an exclusive competition for a free launch of a one new CubeSat on the first commercial launch mission. 
um, on board Soyuz 2.1A Fregat, uh, operated by GK Launch Services from Baikonur in the second quarter of 2020. And the competition is addressed to all the IEF member organizations and priority is given to space university teams with emerg uh, from emerging countries, of course. And the deadline for the application to apply for participating in this competition is the 8th of uh, August. Um, I would like to call on stage now the representative of K uh, JK so, uh, launch services, uh, Mrs. Mila Savielieva, Director of Marketing and Communications, to give us some more details in the short presentation on this competition. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Christian, for short introduction and Vitaly. <laughs> Uh, just a second. I have to be prepared. Yes. So, sorry. Just a second. First of all, I'm really glad to be here and uh, present uh, present our competition. Uh, I would like to speak uh, of the GK Launch Services team and announce the competition for free launch of one new COPSAT on the first commercial mission of uh, GK Launch Services. So this is uh, short information about competition. Our mission planned on the second quarter of uh, 2020 and now we are looking uh, for the great students project uh, which can be launched with us. You can find detailed information about competition on our website and uh, on AIF website. We accept application, as Christian already said, until the 8th of August. And uh, we will announce to the winner during the International Astronautical Congress this year in Washington, D.C. So this is short information about GK Launch Services. Uh, GK Launch Services was founded by Glove Cosmos and Cosmotras on April 25th uh, on, uh, in uh, 2017 as an operator of Soyuz 2 commercial launches from Russian spaceports. Mm. On this slide, you can see our, our, our main uh, subcontractors, uh, Progress Rocket Center uh, that manufactures Soyuz 2 launch vehicle, NPO Lavochkin, uh, which produced Fregat upper stage and uh, they test and adapt Fregat, and Sunki, uh, the provider of uh, ground infrastructure facilities uh, at Russian spaceports. Uh, on this slide, uh, you can see our three spaceports, the historically famous uh, Baikonur, the newest Vostochny, and Aplisetsk. This is main information about Soyuz. Uh, Soyuz uh, 2 launch vehicle with a Fregat upper stage is designed for uh, satellite launching into Earth's orbits of various heights and inclination, including uh, GEO, GTO, SSO, as well as uh, escape trajectories. The Soyuz LV has had more than uh, 1,980 launches, of which 72 of them are with a Fregat upper stage. Uh, general capabilities you can see on this slide. Fregat is a multipurpose universal vehicle uh, that enables highly precise orbit injection and uh, optimal delivery of payloads to almost any types of orbit one, uh, within one mission by having a multiplier restart capability of its uh, main thruster up to seven ignition. Um, so, uh, now we are going to watch a video with our typical cluster mission.
just a second. We have to back to our presentation. Uh, so, uh, GK have uh, three upcoming commercial uh, multiple uh, satellite mission on Soyuz 2 with a frigate that will be entirely operated by GK. Two of them are planned in the second quarter and uh, fourth quarter in next year of uh, 2020. One is planned in the last quarter or uh, in uh, 2021. Price per kilo for CubeSat and SmallSats uh, is from $20,000 uh, till uh, $30,000. So, uh, it's really important to GK uh, to support scientific projects, especially those uh, made by students. We are really happy to provide a launch opportunity of one new CubeSat on our first commercial mission. By this, we are standing behind new ideas coming from young ones. And this is the first step in the brighter future coming forward. Soyuz, uh, for our understanding, Soyuz is not just a rocket. How could rocket be more? So, oh, sorry. Soyuz is the only rocket which carries humans to ISS. More than 1,890 Soyuz family rockets were launched. We have three spaceports and we can launch as often as needed. Soyuz with a frigate can create three different orbits within one mission. Soyuz can operate all types mm -hmm. of orbits. Launch vehicle can be used with or without uh, upper stages. And of course, we can launch dedicated and cluster missions. And uh, I'm really glad to mention our online price calculator. You can get the price of CubeSat and SmallSat satellites of mass up to 120 kilos. You need to fill, uh, fill in satellite data and you will get the uh, launch quotation within one business day. Uh, this is short illustration how it looks. Uh, you need to select uh, the spacecraft type, or you need to launch. Uh, you need to select launch window. Oops. Launch window is the most important thing. <laughs> Deploy or separation systems. And what's interesting, uh, you can get uh, insurance quotation. Uh, uh, Proposal can include, uh, launch proposal can include insurance uh, for spacecraft transportation, processing and launch up to separation in the orbit, and such option can be added to the contract. Uh, insurance packages provided by Marsh. Yeah, it, it's got how to look for the final documents. The calculator is a convenient tool that helps the customer to plan mission launches and uh, in, in a comfortable and rapid manner and uh, to get all the information directly from the operator. It's really convenient. And one slide from uh, the latest launch from Vostochny. And if you need write, you know our contact. Thank you very much uh, for your interest. You can sign up on our website uh, and uh, social networks. We will be glad to help. And thank you, AIF. This is a great opportunity. Thank you very much. This brings us, to, uh, brings us really to the end and to the coffee break. Once again, a big thanks to all the speakers here and also to General Bolding back home. Um, and I would like to ask you to be back here again at 1650s so or it's 10 to 5, if that is possible. So it's rather a short coffee break. Thank you very much. Great. Same time, same station same time, tomorrow. Same place tomorrow. Okay, and, and I'll I'll find a long <laughs>